we have today the privilege to have the visit of Professor uh, Michael Leibowitz, uh, Emeritus Professor of Economy of the Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada. He is uh, also one of the most uh, uh, improving uh, scholar in, in the discussion today of the socialism of uh, 21st century, uh, this uh, movement to recover the values of Marxism and to recover the possibilities of building a new society of justice and equity uh, in the world. So, uh, good morning, Michael. Good morning, Aurelio. I'm glad uh, to be here. Uh, and we are very glad to have you here with us in Cuba and in this program. Uh, we would like you to begin with some uh, views of how you arrived to be uh, an economist, a socialist economist within uh, the North American society, and, and, and what are your highlights in this career? Well, I, I certainly didn't intend to become an economist, and I certainly did not intend to become a socialist economist or a Marxist. I came from a working class family. Uh, my father worked in a factory, and my mother was a bookkeeper. Um, and um, like many people from working class families, my goal was to become rich. Um, and so I w went to a business school um, to study accounting um, and business administration. I began to specialize in economics and marketing research. And then because we didn't have very much money, I shifted to night school and worked during the day. Mm -hmm and I got a job working in market research in a large electrical uh, manufacturing company. Um, and I began to find some very interesting things, which was the economics I was learning in the university was telling me how the market worked and how prices were set through this you know, mechanism. But at work, I was learning that prices were being set once a month at the meetings of the electrical companies. Um, so I began to realize I was being lied to in all the economics I was learning. So these shook me up. Um, they began to make me start to, to think about questions. But I, I wasn't a socialist. I was just a person who was looking for answers. So when I went to graduate school, I, at the University of Wisconsin, I decided that what I would try to do is study economic institutions um, in order to be able to find out, to develop my own theory. Um, and in the course of studying economic institutions, I became more and more oriented toward Marx. Um, now, this was, didn't come initially, um, and uh, I was more thinking in terms of economic institutions. Um, and w what also happened when I was in graduate school at university was I became radicalized politically. Um, one of the things that radicalized me was the Cuban Revolution, uh, because this was I, w I started graduate school in 1960, and I became a very early member of Fair Play for Cuba um, mm -hmm. in in graduate school, and I was also radicalized by the civil rights movement uh, that was happening in the United States at the time. Um, so I became very much involved in supporting um, those struggles in the in the U.S. South. Um, and when I went to, to get my first job uh, as a teacher, to, as a professor in university. I went to, I found a, a job in a new university that was starting in Canada, in Vancouver, um, the first year of the university. I found that that was an interesting challenge um, to go to a new university. Um, and so I went there, and while, I, in, the, in the first few years there, I began to, you know, teach, uh, but also learn about Marxism. Um, and I, the things I specialized in university in teaching were uh, Marxist economics, economic thought, but also uh, socialist economies, because that was one of the things that I had studied in graduate school. And, excuse me, what was the socialist economy that was studied there? Theoretically, or do you analyze the socialistic processes? Well, in graduate school, I had basically taken a course in the Soviet economy. Uh, Soviet so that's economy. what I really yeah. understood, the Soviet economy. Um, and um, then when I began to teach a course in comparative economic systems, I had to look at other economies. Um, and one of the things I did look at, you know, especially, was, you know, the Yugoslav economy. Um, because I became very interested in this alternative model, um, which was the model which involved worker management. Uh, now, at the same time, 
Um, I was also becoming active politically in, um, in the Social Democratic Party there, the New Democratic Party. Um, and there I became you know, uh, very much involved in, in developing economic policy, but always emphasizing the importance of worker management, of workers' mm -hmm. control, opening the books of the companies, um, ensuring transparency, that how can, you know, how can companies keep secrets both not only from the workers, but also from the state. Um, so th those, those questions became very interesting to me. And then I began to study more intensely the Yugoslav model because I became convinced that for Marx, worker management was important. He's always stressed in, in his work this problem of this, the division between thinking and doing about how capitalism creates a condition which thought and action, thinking and doing, are completely separated for the worker. Uh, and so I became convinced that, well, if we're going to talk about socialism, we have to talk about recombining thinking and doing, that workers have to be able to plan, workers have to be able to make decisions within the workplace. So I studied the Yugoslav economy, and I used to go there every year uh, during my uh, break, uh, my time off, to go to meetings um, and also to observe workers' councils in, in operation. Wouldn't you say that they, in the same way that uh there is no reason to think that uh, the failure of socialism in the Soviet Union is the failure of socialism, but the failure of one experiment, one experience. We, could, we should have to go also to uh, overview the autogestion, auto system and the experience of Yugoslavia. Oh, definitely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, I mean, I looked at the, you look at the Soviet system and as it mm -hmm. was working, and, and what was the role of workers there? Well, workers had protection from losing their jobs. Okay. Um, that, there was no question about it. And that's very important. You know, they, don't, they aren't faced with the fear of, the, you know, of unemployment. Um, but on the other hand, they had no decision making within the workplace. And so they were completely alienated from the process. They didn't care if they made bad things. All they cared about was self-interest, which was, and the self-interest was getting the bonus at the end of the month or getting the bonus at the end of the quarter. But like the, the whole system was one of complete alienation from the production process. Now, it wasn't, when I visited Yugoslavia, uh, I could see quite different reaction uh, in that workers were involved in, in ex extensive discussions in the workers' councils. There were problems in, in Yugoslavia. I don't want to idolize that system at all, but the concept of worker management, I think, is, is essential. So, so what, what we saw happen in the Soviet Union was, you know, an ex was one of the experiments of building capitalism, of building socialism, and we see the results of that. So what we have to learn is, don't go that way again. You know, mm -hmm. don't, do, don't sure. try to repeat that experience, and we have to learn. And that's one of the things always emphasized in Venezuela, where I, where I am these days, um, and that is, you have to be prepared to invent. You don't simply take a model you know, and just uh, apply it. And I think one of the most interesting things that Fidel said uh, a number of years ago was the greatest mistake we've made was thinking somebody knew how to build socialism. <laughs> you had feeling, uh, the, the feeling of uh, sympathy and commitment with the Cuban revolution since the 60s. I would like you to tell us a little about this uh, process of your relation with the Cuban Revolution and our uh, achievements and also our difficulties and our uh, challenges today. Ah, well, I, I didn't come to Cuba until the early 1970s, and I always came as a tourist. Just be tourist, but I would observe, you know, and I was always very you know, inspired by the way people interacted um, in, in Cuba, the, the sense of solidarity that the, there was here, um, and also the sense of, of solidarity that was an international solidarity, I mean, because I always would meet veterans from Angola, uh, you know, and, and it was really, you know, a wonderful experience. There I was intellectually looking at Yugoslavia, thinking, well, you, worker management is right, but Yugoslavia was not inspiring at all. So I used to say to everyone, my head is in Yugoslavia, my heart is in Cuba. Um, mm -hmm. And what stood out for me in Cuba was that, that sense of solidarity. And I'm absolutely convinced that the period of that horrible, incredible period 
uh, you know, which begins from eight, 1989, but even earlier, um, and the loss of so much of the foreign trade, uh, that Cuba could never have survived this without that solidarity that had been built up over the years. Because, you know, it was, you know, one, a miracle in the sense of a wonderful thing to see, you know. Um, not, not a miracle that was something that couldn't be explained, because it can be explained by the solidarity that had been built up here. And I think that sense of solidarity and the importance of creating a society based on solidarity um, is an essential element in building socialism for the 21st century. You know, I think it's, it must be part of it. Um, I've just finished a, a new book, which will be published in the United States, um, which talks about uh, social ownership of the means of production, social uh, uh, production organized by workers, and the importance of a solidarian society, a society based on solidarity. Um, and I think that, that those three sides are essential elements, and Cuba, from my perspective, developed that side of solidarity more than any place else. There is a difference between talking of socialization and state socialism. Mm -hmm. How good do you feel that in a new building of a social, socialist economy, a this idea of socialization and state uh, socialism uh, will, will develop? Well, you know, this is an old question, you know, because Lenin talked about the difference between socialization and confiscation. You know, there's, you know, the state ownership in itself is not the same as social ownership. This was one thing I thought the, the Yugoslavs were very good on. Um, in 1950, Marshall Tito said, uh, in introducing the law on workers' management in, in Yugoslavia, said, we feel that, unlike the people from the Soviet Union, we feel that state ownership is the lowest form of social property, not the highest form. Uh, and mm -hmm. what they meant was, in order to make property really social, you have to have worker management. Now, I think that 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 was true as a step. But, you know, the problem that emerged in Yugoslavia was that worker management became group ownership. Uh, rather, it, it belong, the companies belonged to the groups of workers, and they, there was no solidarity within the society. Workers did not feel they had a responsibility. And excuse me, wouldn't you think that uh, work management can, could be implemented also in a state property? Socialist property. Oh yes, I think. But I think it's important to recognize that uh, I, I think worker management must be introduced into into state sure. property. Um, that you cannot develop, you know, the people, the socialist people, by putting them in a situation in which they receive orders from above, and and just simply raise their hands and approve those orders. Um, that does not develop human beings. Um, and I think that's at the, what the greatest insight from Marx, which is to develop human beings, and Marx talked about rich human beings, rich individuality. To develop that, you have to have practice. Uh, and people only develop through their own activity. That's at the core of Marx. Well, what kind of activity are workers engaged in if they're just simply following orders? So I think worker management is absolutely essential in social property, to, to make state property social property. But it's not enough. And that's, I think, what Yugoslavia demonstrated. Because you also have to have a commitment by the workers in those enterprises to serve society, uh, to, to internalize the, their, their commitment to the rest of their communities, etc. cetera. Um, that didn't happen in Yugoslavia. That was, I think, the, where they went off. And uh, Michael, since you have been living in Caracas, within the and living and producing and thinking and uh, participating in the, the 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 Venezuelan experience, revolutionary experience, for ten years I think more or less. Seven. Seven, seven years more or less. Well I would like uh, to ask you uh, what do you think have been the main contribution of the Cuban revolutionary Experience in in the sense of um, Chavez, uh, President Chavez it has been very much influenced by 
the, the solidarity in, in the Cuban Revolution. Um, and also, he, he constantly comes back to talk about Che, Che Guevara, um, and the importance of developing social human beings. Um, and so that is a very important element in, in the, the thinking in, in Venezuela. Um, now, the, I think compared to the rest of Latin America, um, Venezuela is far advanced in terms of the ideology that's developed. Uh, in practice, there are other questions. There are many problems because of the culture of corruption and clientelism that was inherited from the oil rentist economy. Um, but I think that, um, that the concept of solidarity uh, has been you know, there and transmitted from Cuba. And the most obvious example is through ALBA. Um, but even before ALBA, we had, you know, uh, Mission Milagro was mm -hmm. such an important element, and, and the whole process of Cuban doctors coming um, to, to work in, in uh, Barrio Dentro, uh, this has been, these have been the important examples of an alternative. Um, and um, one of the things that, you know, in Latin America um, had a horrible period of, the, you know, from the 80s and 90s, you know, the effect of neoliberalism. Um, was a process of absolutely demand, dismantling the state, you know, social services, um, and you know, destroying industries that had been developing during the period of import substitution, uh, and Latin America suffered incredibly in that period, um, and so. Many countries, Bolivia, uh, Ecuador, Ecuador with its incredible debt that was it's a criminal the way the debt, you know, foreign debt was mm. developed there, uh, mm. began to you know, reject you know, neoliberalism. Um, but no, there was no model of an alternative. And it's most interesting to recognize that when Chavez emerged, and Chavez had thought about many questions uh, about democracy in, in, while in prison, uh, you know, when Chavez emerged, his conception still was, we reject neoliberalism, but we're going to look for a third way. Um, his idea was we can work with, you know, uh, we can have a different kind of capitalism, uh, a good capitalism. Now, it, came, it didn't take very long for him to recognize that the oligarchy in Venezuela and U.S. imperialism did not want a good capitalism. <laughs> they wanted the old capitalism that they had. But, but that was a shock to Chavez, and that's what radicalized him increasingly. The, the opposition uh, moved him to, you know, and it's something that, that Marx said, you know, in, in writing about the Civil War in France, where he said, um, slaveholders result, revolts put the sword in the hand of the social yeah. revolution, and it moves faster. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened in Venezuela. So that move, you know, Venezuela advanced, you know, on that basis of reacting and seeing that there was a necessity for a, you know, a real alternative to capitalism. And Chavez began to talk about what he called the social economy. And I was working as, as an advisor in the Ministry for the Social Economy at the time, and Chavez was talking about the the capitalist economy is perverse. It doesn't care about workers. It doesn't care about the environment. It doesn't care about the worker's family. It doesn't care about the children. Uh, it's a perverse you know, uh, society. We talk about, as an alternative, the social economy. The social economy is based on human beings, on use values, not exchange values. Chavez was talking about socialism before he ever used the word. You know, but he was calling it the social economy. And then in 2005, he, he came out and said, we have to build, we have to reinvent socialism, and it can't be the perversion of the Soviet Union. It can't be based on the state and on technology and machines. It has to be based on a new humanistic uh, you know, uh, socialism, uh, a socialism which is based on human beings. I think that tr was transmitted throughout Latin America. Um, and I think that... that I think you know you, you can look almost at a domino theory of the left. Without Cuba, there would not have been Venezuela. Without Venezuela, there would not have been Bolivia and Ecuador. Uh, I think that those are all connected, you know, in, in that way. I noticed that the Chavez is very, very fond of uh, reading the important, the most important, improving uh, socialist thinking now. And for example, he uh, talks about Mesaros. Sometimes, do you think this uh, allows 
us to say today there is taking shape a model or a project or an idea, more, a more precise idea of uh, building uh, this new uh, socialism? Chavez does read it, he studies it, and he, the passages that he talks about, uh, he, he definitely understands. Um, so I'm impressed by that, and I think that in many respects, Metzeros, uh, who is working largely in the sections on socialism, from Marx's Grundriss, a return to Marx's ideas about the new society, that that is, in fact, being transmitted through a lot of what you know, Chavez is saying. So you do have this new idea, which Chavez has called the elementary triangle of socialism, of social ownership of the means of production, social production organized by workers for the purpose of social needs and, and communal needs and purposes. Um, you do have that idea emerging. Um, and there are different ways in which you know, that is being organized. It, but it's emphasized, and a lot of this actually goes back to the Venezuelan constitution too, where they talk about you know, the goal is full development of human beings, and this is only can occur through protagonism. Um, and that model of protagonism as a way of developing human beings is, is being attempted in Venezuela. Um, the communal councils uh, are councils of 200 to 400 people in urban areas, and they are making decisions. They get budgets. They can make decisions on repairing their areas, repairing their roads, um, how they will do that. That's very important. They have a sense of, of pride uh, in what they're able to accomplish uh, through their activity. Those communal councils now are being brought together in a larger unit, slowly, the commune, which may mm -hmm. combine 20 communal councils. Um, and that then becomes something, a, a body that can use, combine more and more. The next step from Chavez, in Chavez's thinking is to combine communes to the communal city. And what Chavez says, the communal council, that is the cell of a new socialist state. You know, that we build from that local involvement, you know, upward, um, mm -hmm. and that we are going to replace the old capitalist state, which, which we still have, he says, with this new socialist state. I think that's important thinking. Um, that idea of decentralization, because this is a concept of decentralization, but not decentralization for management from above, mm -hmm. which corporations yes. do, and yes. neoliberalism yes. wants, but decentralization from below with power actually being in the hands of those below. I think that's an attractive idea, not only in Latin America, um, you know, it's a very attractive idea in Bolivia, um, and also in, when, when um, uh, Correa talks about the citizens' revolution, he's talking about that local involvement, that local decision making, uh, but it's also, my own view is, that is the only way in which we're going to be able to succeed in transmitting the idea of socialism to capitalist countries, to North America. Because the idea, you know, in, if you look at the United States and look at the Tea Party movement now, yeah. this f <laughs> emerging fascist movement mm. from below, yeah. The last thing they want there is a strong state. They already feel that they've lost all kinds of power to the large corporations. Mm -hmm. And so what they want is the power to make decisions themselves. Well, I, when I go back to Canada, I talk always about you know, the importance of the communal councils. Who, who in your neighborhood would be opposed to making decisions, having more power to make decisions? I think that's... That is the attractive idea that, that we can sell socialism on in, in, in capitalist countries. I also feel uh, there is somehow a new uh, importance of the constitutional uh, frame in these changes. I, I, I don't know, I believe perhaps it is the, because of the plural uh, uh, coexistence within a contradictory and con conflicting sometimes relation between oligarchies that stay there mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and the forces of the new uh, position, the revolutionary position in the government. Mm -hmm. I think in this perhaps the changes in constitutional frame for this society, 
is getting more and more importance. Do you see? Oh. How do you think uh, this is uh, in, in Ecuador, in Venezuela, and in Bolivia? I think this is essential. I think the important thing to recognize is we're playing under the capitalist rules. Yeah, you know, um, and that one thing that Chavez recognized when he came out of prison was we have to have a constitutional change. We have to have a constituent assembly. And that's what he campaigned on. Um, and, so, and that was the first thing he did was have a constituent assembly. And, and that constituent assembly began to change the rules of the game to, to create new, a new focus. Now, the, the constitution that was introduced in Venezuela was not a socialist constitution. It still had independence of the central bank. It still had the emphasis on, on you know, supporting capitalism, et cetera. It was, sort of, it was a, a photograph of the relation of forces at the time. But I think that what was happened in Venezuela with the, with the introduction of a constituent assembly that wrote a new constitution where the social movements played a major role in that new constitution, uh, that that pointed a way that we see in Bolivia, we see in Ecuador, and we saw the desire you know, of, of Zelaya to introduce this in Honduras. You know, that this, we have to change the rules of the game. We can't always play on their playing field. Um, we have to, you know, but you can't just simply say, let's have a constituent assembly, oh. a new constitution. You have to have a movement that builds it, a movement from below. If you had a new constituent assembly in the United States at this point, I think it would be a horror because there is no movement, there is nothing, you know, uh, no popular movement that is looking to a, a vision of a, of a new equitable society. I wanted to switch to another space, which is the international space, mm -hmm. since you have been also uh, an specialist in the Soviet economy. Yeah. What could you say now of the situation of the big, the ancient, the old, the other times socialist powers the evolution of the economy and the evolution of the society uh, in the so in the former Soviet Union, in the, to, mainly in Russia today. I would like I would like to talk us a little about this situation today, this international yes. situation of the former socialist countries and the role they play and they may play in the future uh, correlation of forces in the world. Um. My own feeling is that um, in both the Soviet Union and China, um, that the nature of those societies were such as to lead to the creation of emerging capitalist classes within the society, in the managers. Um, mm -hmm. And um, that, you know, the, that those societies have in fact moved to capitalism. Um, this may not be a, you know, a, a popular view, but this is my view that these are, are capitalist economies. Um, they may have you know, uh, people who are, you know, reject you know, American imperialism, uh, American domina U.S. domination of the world. But I, th I think that um, if you look at um, 